and Jeff Poe founded Blum & Poe in September of 1994 in Santa Monica, California. Since that time, they have developed a strong reputation for fostering the careers of Los Angeles-based and international artists such as Takashi Murakami, Mark Grojan, Henry Taylor, and so many others. Partners in business for 25 years, Tim and Jeff now have galleries in LA, New York, and Tokyo. Tim and I met in front of a Sam Durant work that I was explaining to someone else when he started asking me questions about it in his own booth at an art fair without me having any idea who he was. Today we talked about the first work of art we each bought in the same year and for the same price, Ramdas, death, and how we are all just walking each other home. If someone cares about aesthetics and come, someone cares about space, then of course, you know, what you choose to, to spend um, your time with, right? Um, as much as who you choose to spend your time with says a lot about you. So talk to me about how you think about your personal space. What do you like, what do you like to have around you? Right. Um, <clears throat> raw, authentic, mm -hmm. true. Truth, actually, those three words always are key mm -hmm. on every level, whether it's relationships or uh, space, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, so we, we gravitate very naturally to organic, um, <clears throat> raw, um, generally speaking, space. Um, but just like the gallery just like the books, just like music, just like space. I'm inter we're interested in so much and we're privileged to be able to have um, like different ex space experiences in our lives. Mm -hmm. So it's like we um, revel in, in, in creating and living and spending time in different kinds, like say the gallery, even the gallery has two different spaces on, on the main mothership on La Cienega with the museum gauge spaces downstairs, the more loft-like raw space upstairs, right? Even New York, there's the townhouse experience. In Tokyo, there's a cl very clean, minimal Tokyo 2020 vibes, right? I, I just, and, and everything is specific to that, whether it's the, the furniture or the, um, what's going, not, you know, what, what's happening in that space. Same, same with the house. So do you have, uh, do you have art in your bedroom? Okay. So the, the art, that's an interesting thing. Um, <laughs> it's fascinating actually. I, there was somebody who said a long time ago that somebody had come to my house and a lot of people, people of course have projections about how people are, how they live or what mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. without really knowing the truth. All and, the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Um, and the thought was that of, of course I lived undoubtedly in the hills in a white modernist cube. Right. Hyper pristine. Sorry. Hyper pristine. Cold. Yeah. Cold. Certain kind of art. And of course, <laughs> it's not like that at all. Um, not to say that I don't appreciate good stuff like that. I mean, and we've, we used to live in a modernist redwood house in the path, mountains of Pasadena, for example, which in fact, allowed for very little art to be hung. And I was okay with that because I'm surrounded by it so much at the gallery and with all we do always that it was like a neutral zone. A lot of some of the best architecture that I love, in fact, it's funnily enough, doesn't really allow for space for, for a lot of art. Interesting. And LA with its history and architecture speaks to that quite clearly, especially because of particular mid-century uh, aesthetics in mm -hmm. architecture. So, yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, wow, what do you live, what do you hang, what do you live with? I This is a very old hacienda. It, it does have quite, quite, a, quite a fair amount of wall space, but it's not a, a house that was constructed to show off. Yeah, particularly that. the art of our time, yeah. Um. It, it's it's very different. It's a lot of art that I don't represent. Um, in fact, it's 
and there's no direct reason for that. It's just that way, right? So like in this room, we're sitting with um, a Jack Smith photograph of the, the, the woman eating the pomegranate, something I gave to Maria for reasons that are, are, could be quite clear. What have we got? Linder collage behind you. This is Lutz Bascher, the 80s, classic 80s piece by her. This room we're sitting in is, is off, is, is on the other end of the house. It's like the kind of free zone. And um, my boys are off at college, but that's quite recent. And so this was like their wing. Mm -hmm. It would, it's like a free zone and our house was the house for gatherings for everybody. And so I kind of worked with them to curate what's back here. We got the Richard Prince Instagram piece here. You know, a lot of text, obviously, but I also wanted um, uh, pointedly some uh, women back here. And then, you know, the rest of the house is is really just um, quite specific. There's a, a, a Mark, uh, there's a Mark Roach on face painting. I always have at least one Roach on, on rotation. For all kinds of reasons, there's a Sergei Jensen painting. There's a um, um, uh, Alexander Tovbor, great Danish artist who we, we represent. Uh, Solange Pessoa, great Brazilian we represent. There's um, Elaine Cameron Weir, who we collect quite heavily but don't represent, for example. Um, yeah. So it's it's just, yeah, they always want me to change it out, though. It's like... But I can't, can we, the kids pick their own art, right? Like the boys have Henry Taylor portraits of them in their rooms, nice. which is so cool. Yeah. Uh, Lucina still lives with a Murakami painting, um, things like that. And, you know, they always ask, like, can we rotate, which I always want to get around to do, but I'm so busy doing shows and things all over the world that I can't get <laughs> quite get around to it. This has been a permanent, semi-permanent for quite a while. And in your bedroom, is there art? Okay, so in the bedroom, wow. Uh, is there, I can't even think if there's one thing. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so there are two things, and that's generally the case. There's two Friedrich Kunath paintings hmm. that were gifts to my wife and I, each individually made for the both of us. And those are, you know, on the dresser. They're not hung in a special way. They're just there. And yeah. those, we have a very special relationship with, uh, with Friedrich. Yeah. Um, and everything, and the rest of it's just neutral. Yeah. So there was a great collector named John Branston. I don't know if you ever met him. He um, was a San Francisco collector and his parents were collectors and his grandparents were collectors. And uh, he was the head of the acquisition committee when I joined the Berkeley Art Museum. And he... In my interview, which was the first of seven interviews through the course of that day, um, over breakfast, he asked me, the first question was, if you had an unlimited budget for the museum, uh, you know, what would you acquire? What would, would be the first three pieces you would acquire? And then he asked, you know, personally, what, you know, what would you pick? And he sort of famously for me had a small Rothko, um, like a domestically scaled Rothko, which was pink and orange, and it always hung in his bedroom. Mm. Um, and he hung it to the right of his bed. And he, his philosophy was that um, you should hang your most favorite artwork in your bedroom, and it should be the last thing you look at before you go to sleep, and the first thing you look up at, mm. look at when you wake up in the morning. I don't know if I agree with that or not, mm -hmm. but since then I've always been curious mm -hmm. what people um, sleep with. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I think at one point I will do that. You know, it's, we, we're busy people, obviously, and I'd, we're also very low key um, here. So um, I think with the kids now off to school, my daughter's a junior in high school, and she'll be, I think there'll be a shift and there'll be a different, you know, evolution of space and the way we live, undoubtedly, right? Evolution, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure that'll happen because I can see that. It's just, it's not, it, it's like, the, it's books. Also, yeah. it's books there too. Like everywhere's books. <laughs> so what was the first work of art you ever bought? Oh, gee. Wow. 
Good question. Okay. Well, I think actually the first really I knew I was buying, it was like a, a commitment, like a thing, like a transaction that had meaning. I bought a Murakami piece from him for, I think it was $250 in 1991. Um, very small piece. Uh, he needed the cash. There was a, a friend of mine and I bought, bought a piece. That was the first. Yeah, that was the first one. Definitely. It's so interesting because um, the first work of art that I bought that I really remember buying was also in 1991, and it was also $250, and it was a Karen Kalimnik Jane drawing. Crazy. Crazy, So right? cool, yeah. So, uh, Definitely. And, and I had met Karen, you know, and, sure. um, and I liked her, and I mm -hmm. thought she was, you know, funny, mm -hmm. and I thought her art was, you know, puzzling. Yeah. And so. Yeah, for sure. I would have probably done the same had I known her, her <laughs> in 91. Yeah. Actually, Carrie Leibowitz told me to buy it. So. Amazing. I know. but And it still hangs in my house. So in good. It's original frame. So nice. Yeah. So from there, did you buy art regularly or was that like an anomaly? Well, or? you know, I'm not, a, I, I wasn't like a collect, a, a quote unquote, I wasn't really a collector. Like some people are collectors, like guys generally are like um, comic book. I'm not saying mm. that's only guys, but from my peer group who grew up together, there's always the dude who collects comics or um, uh, figures, like yeah, figurines right, or right. what have you. Yeah, baseball I, cards. I didn't, I wasn't into that. I wasn't really into that. Um, but the f I think if I brought it up to the family, they would say, you definitely have a, <laughs> you're a collector. Because I, 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 I do collect, I've always collected stuff, in fact, when I reflect. And I don't get rid of it either, by the way. <laughs> but, um, you know, look, back in the beginning, it was nobody knew where anything was going. And I was just trying to figure out where I was heading personally. Mm -hmm. So there was no, you know, I wish I would have known more and, and collected more. But I did know and I did as much as I could. But. Back then in Japan, in, to in Tokyo days, and then thereafter building the gallery in the early days, I mean, it was just about getting the bills paid. So you did as much as you could. And usually, generally, for the first chunk of the time of the gallery, anything that, you know, if things that I purchased on my own, I generally have kept almost everything. Mm -hmm. But things that you buy as a gallery, you know, you use to grow the gallery. Yeah, of course. So it's a kind of two-tiered approach. Yeah. Very distinctly different, definitely. So you referenced Japan. Um, talk a little bit about how you ended up there uh, and what you did there. And mm -hmm. I mean, for me, knowing you and as like an outside person, it, it seems that looking at your life, that that would be an iconic time. That would be a, a you know, career defining time. So whether you knew it in the moment or not, but looking back. 100% was. Went there in 84 for the first time as a student at UCLA um, in the summer. And then something triggered in me. I went back again the next year in the, in the summer. And it just something triggered for me. And I became kind of singularly obsessed with it. And I was more interested in the contemporary culture. Although I studied deeply, ended up at UCLA, even studied the history. Uh, also the pop political history. Uh, I was I was a political philosophy and film major, in fact, at UCLA, um, and I ended up through that may, like ended up studying Japanese cinema, which you could do, and also uh, philosophy, you know, philosophy. Um, just became singularly obsessed, and was ended up thereafter trying to figure out how I could get back. So it was just luck of the draw. We moved to California when I was nine or eight, eight or nine years old. I knew that that was already a good thing because we were coming from Ohio, Pennsylvania, not to disparage there, but I just knew that that was for me. <laughs> and being on the West Coast, right? You're a, you're a door to the, the the Pacific Rim. I mean, and and um, as opposed to the normal arc mm -hmm. of East Coast, say if you grow up in the Midwest and you end up on one of the coasts, normally if you end up on the East Coast, you're I'm likely going to end up 
if you have an international a- ambition to, to Europe. Yeah. Um, so it totally changed my life because I looked, started looking at the world through a totally different lens, which back then wasn't, you know, the world wasn't what it is now by any stretch. The flatness of the earth wasn't what it is. The information wasn't as it was, you know, so on and so forth. So totally changed. Any, anyway, so ultimately I did figure out how to get back there and live and work and ended up doing that for almost five, four and a half, five years in the, in the nineties. Um, you know, I, again, I couldn't have scripted. I, it just was my life. Right. Um, but you know, it was difficult work, but it was like obviously karmic. Um, I think, I, I feel like I must've been a Japanese in a former lifetime in a way. Cause even more now than even then, I feel very, so comfortable there. Mm-hmm. Um, always mm-hmm. like immediately I just feel comfortable. Um, so that's the quick mm-hmm. uh, uh, version mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it totally upend. I mean, it didn't upend my view of the world because I didn't really have a view of the world. Right. Mm-hmm. It just, that was, mm-hmm. that became my view of the world was looking at the world through that lens. And, and that meant aesthetics, that meant um, politics, that meant, you know, everything really, frankly. And it was at a particular moment. And so understanding the history of it, of course, with anything is, is vital. Um, yeah. Wild time though, really wild time. I mean, it was wild days. So interesting because I, you know, was born in New York and then I grew up in California. My parents moved out here also. And when I was in, um, elementary school, my best friend was a Japanese girl and her younger sister was my younger sister's best friend. And, and so we had, uh, access to Japanese culture. I mean, cartoons and food and the cherry blossom festival and had our kimonos. And, and so I always dreamed of, of going to Japan. And, um, so I, I think that's something that, you know, that I connected with you on it. Um, maybe even when we first met, it was just an allure of that. And so I was so, I was thrilled, you know, when we hired Shigeru Bon to build the new Aspen Art Museum. I mean, I'd been to Japan before that, but but just having that opportunity to be there kind of repeatedly. Yeah, for sure. I get it. Yeah, it was a wild time. But I, I mean, I learned, you know, the art world while there. I mean, I didn't learn it working for a gallery in, you know, London or New York or LA or whatever. So it's quite a different approach. So what year did you open a gallery? And, and how did you meet Jeff? Uh, well, we opened in 94. So uh, September of 94. So it's 25 years. Amazing. I know. Um, met Jeff through my wife. They had worked together. And I don't, you know, the, the chain of events doesn't matter exactly. But um, I met him through her. And at one point after meeting him, I was still living in Japan with my wife. And at that point had become my wife. Um, the gallery he was working for closed and he was trying to figure out what to do. And he remembered me and that I had expressed an interest and intent to open it, come back to LA and open a gallery. And so he reached out. Okay. Yeah. So why do you love art? <laughs> um, Well, I like great art because it reminds me of, um, I find the greatest art to be, well, I mean, you can say the kind of rote reasoning of enriching and enlivening and reflect reflection of a time or our time or the time in which it was made, or if it's timeless, it's even better, Uh, you know, but when it's great art, it's um, I don't know. It's 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 both. You know, it can be a a, a moment of of taking a breath, um, which could be seen as a a 
deflection from life, but I, I don't think it's that. I think it's actually looking at a deeper part of the world and the and and ideally a, a truth that somebody's looking for or representing or trying to represent. That's the great right for me always. It's like that's and and in working with artists and being around it so much, um, I so respect when an artist is you know on the edge like the quote-unquote you know looking into the void or perhaps even leaping into it um for me is is the most exciting thing to think about and to think about trying to you know live your own life in a similar way knowing that you know i'm not an artist but i can sort of contribute to that vital the, the vital import of of art I mean, it's, it's, it's always important. I, rem I remember back in, in the nineties, I had just come back from Japan. It's funny, actually. That, uh, the other night, two nights ago, I went to the Hammer Museum to see a performance by Mayo Thompson, who you may or may not know, but Mayo is an old friend of mine and he's a very, very legendary and integral musician, artist, thinker, teacher, for the last 50 plus years, it's been involved in so much. And he, um, amongst many, many other things, has a band called Red Crayola. And um, he just, uh, they organized him to play a very important record of his. He played it in, in, its, in total the other night. When we were hanging out in the 90s and we'd done a project in Japan, I remember having this conversation with him, exactly what you're asking me, and him coming from a Texas family, I think that his father was a doctor, and um, him saying so sort of precisely and with great confidence that, you know, art is as important as medicine. Um, so that was when I was really a student, basically, and he was one of my teachers, you, you could say. And I, I really, really, I never forgot it. I, and when you asked that, I, I thought of that then, because I, I would, they don't teach you that in school even, right? Um, and in some cases, people would think that's classic horseshit, like art world, you know, doublespeak or some shit, which is unfortunate because if people are exposed to and have a person who can navigate them through the world of art, so let's just say contemporary art, we do see you and I how if they let go and open up to it, how much it gives to them and to, and if they're supporting, you know, a museum or, or, or what have you, it's, it's, it's incalculable. So it, you, um, you talked about your interest in truth and, I feel like the answer that you just gave is a truth. Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. But you see, the, the, what we're talking about now is so it's disjunctive from, unfortunately, the system in which we work. Um, and so you're always having to go, go back to this point. Uh, let's use that as one, the key point. Mm -hmm. There's other points. Mm -hmm. but you're always having to go back to this point, always going back. It's like, a ship having to like write itself constantly because the system wants to distract you from the truth um, through markets or all kinds of collusive odd activity of which we're all quite, a, we're both quite well aware of. Um, so it's, it's an interesting line to navigate the reality of the world and the um, issues in which um, we navigate and I mean, when we talk about truth, of course, we're, we're, we're talking about, we're referencing or inferring the opposite, which is lies. And of course, the world has become this battle over truth and lies. Um, not falsehoods even, just, you know, what's, what's real, what's true, and what's fake. Um, so... Yeah, wow, it's really, <laughs> but this is a reflection. The, the art world just is a microcosm of that. Of course, it's happening in every system. Yeah. 
So I um, have talked about this before, but I had the great um, pleasure of recently being in Thailand and working with these teaching monks um, to work on my meditation. And one of the analogies that they used in terms of a meditative practice is moving along a path, right? And, and as you're going on the path, there are always going to be distractions off the path, right? And things that get more and more seductive and beautiful and engaging, right? Because there are things, whatever you believe in, but that, you know, that try and throw you off of, of, of your path, right? Uh, and so I was thinking of, of that as, as you were talking about um, art and truth and the market and, and these, these things that can, um, at maybe their most innocuous, be distractions and maybe at their most um, severe would be malevolent in some way. Well, uh, totally. Um, you know, there's a, a push, obviously, to bring more consciousness, awareness, meditative practice into the world, and certainly that would be helpful in, in, in this case, the art world. Um, you know, whew, We, half of what I do every day is a lot of deep spiritual practice and evolution too, which is very much influences the way I see the world. And, and in, the, in this case, you know, the art world. And in fact, about a year ago, almost right around now, a year ago, uh, I went with uh, some friends. Um, Maria had set it up, of course, um, but she couldn't go because our, our daughter got sick. And we ended up in Maui and we did a three day conference on uh, death. Um, with a, a spectacular man um, uh, called Ram Das, who you likely know. He, he was joined with Joan Halifax and Frank Ostaseki, who are these three great teachers. And so the only reason I'm telling you that is because it's, this relates to my quest for individual truth. And also ha through that, it influences how I navigate my world and, and the world and the art world and what I do in it and how I do it and who I align with and what kind of work I want to do. Um, so, yeah, we can really learn from all these different um, modalities. I think it's, it's um, difficult because, you know, my wife's an Ayurvedic healer and um, psychologist, um, also, so we're, I, I'm blessed to be exposed to different um, philosophy, psychology, and ways of looking at the world every day. And the problems with, again, in this case, the art world is when it, it is totally hermetically sealed off and it becomes this, this groundhog day or, or just loop, just on constant repeat, right? And this can, when you step out of it and, and, can reflect it it's 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 troubling and i think actually the good part of this story is that you know there are a lot of people that are waking up in the world but also in the art world specific and i think that um i've been seeing a thread of awareness or you call it spirituality or call it wake you know, mindfulness uh, something is definitely um, happening uh, globally in, in, in the art world. I mean, you could see this through, I mean, you could pick some certain pinpoints on it, right? When they did, um, I think it was Massimiliano Gioni who did, had the um, Rudolf Steiner work at, at his um, a Biennale, or um, uh, people becoming more aware of uh, Emma Kuntz Institute, which of course, I think people go to Basel every year for the art fair and maybe 1% or less have been to the Gutianum, which is the beautiful, most important uh, organic piece of architecture in the world by Rudolf Steiner or the Emma Kunst Institute. And, you know, cut to years later than the Hilma af Klint show at the Guggenheim, um, you know, right on time. I mean, sure, we could all say it could have happened, but everything always yeah. just unfolds on its time. Yeah. But I think that this is really interesting um, it's not so strange for me to speak to people about things like um, 
what we're talking about, yeah. um, where it wasn't always the case. A lot of the artists that I work with, both for 25 years or even just for a year, have gone through their own evolutions um, and have tapped into this consciousness. Um, it's really fascinating to see, right? And not everybody does it. And if they don't, they often fall away. Mm -hmm. um, that's the nature of, 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 of life. But uh, yeah, but actually the, in the great line that Ram Dass usually and always says and said there, and he just actually passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, you know, we're all just walking each other home. Exactly. Exactly. And it's such a great line and you just want to instill it. It's like, it's all perfect. And if everybody just could like think we're all ultimately going to the same place. Yeah. Let's just sort of, align in the best way possible to get there well i mean i am maybe even famously now known for you know believing in serendipity and synchronicity and um a friend of mine just sent me the ramdas some ramdas thinking about death um within the last few days and um and i love that idea of just all walking each other home and the other Ramdas idea or, or quote that comes to my head almost every day is, you know, just be here now, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's the the first order of business mm -hmm. is to get that understanding, mm -hmm. and then you can move through. But it's a constant practice till the end, mm -hmm. for sure. So, when but this does really influence the way I look at the world, but also how I look at art. I mean, it's really radically um, influenced the way I'm seeing things. Um, and it's interesting because it's the way in which Maria has seen things for a lot longer than I, trust me. And so she's actually always been this quiet um, uh, pointing out certain art or artists that I otherwise might not recognize. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 yeah, it's fascinating. So I I want to ask you about art and energy. I want to ask you about something else, but I'm going to ask you about that first. So, you know, I, I really believe in the power of art to um, exist as these, um, I mean, not all art, of course, because not all art is equal. And I think that's an important point to, you know, make as well. And, and when I asked you about, you know, why you loved art, you talked about great art. And and I do think that that's really important because it's it's not all equal, um, you know, in terms of its ability, I think, to communicate or to um, exist in this, you know, energetic way. Um, but how do you how do you think about the energy of works of art? Do you, do you think they change over time? Do you think you change in relationship to them over time? Do you think they um, mutate based on whichever other art works they're around or where they're living? Um, how, how do you think about that kind of, I don't know, organic? Or yeah, for other sure. It's, it's all through, in this case, me and how I change. Mm -hmm. it, and it's how I look at art differently. Um, the work itself is, is static. That's okay, by the way. It's, that's kind of the beautiful part of it. It's a, it's a captured moment, but if it works, if, if it works, it, it's having a different kind of experience in life, depending on who's standing in front of it or experiencing it or walking through it or listening to it or so on and so forth. Right. That's kind of the great thing. And that's where the great, you know, that's where great art shines so brightly. And you might not even, yeah, you, know, you can't say that you, you see or know as much as I did say when I was 30 as I do now. 100% not at all. Some things I've been blessed to have worked with a group of artists for 25 years. Um, nearly... 99% of whom I still work with. Um, and that's a testament to everybody evolving um, 
Uh, that's an amazing thing. Uh, not to I'm not not to say that my evolution is better than someone else's or something. Yeah, yeah. But inevitably, right? Do people evolve in different ways, and it's just like any relationship. So that's a really um, interesting and and kind of unusual um, reflection, right? So have you? How have you built community? Wow, so that's so cool because community is also another big word for for me and for us. Community, collaboration, cooperation, bit really massive. And I think it's because, again, people want. I want that, and people want this. They're craving it. Mm-hmm. We're sitting up here in the Hollywood Hills, just to be blunt. It's you know an old old Hollywood Hills, very stuffed with great history, both filmic and and art and and music. In fact. Um, and I think back then I know for a fact that there was great community up here. And this house we're sitting in was a great hub for that. Um, we had talked about it, but you know, down the street is David Hockney and um, the Mamas and the Papas were over here and John Cassavetes lived down here in Sam, Pe- Sam Peckinpah right over here, all at the same time, right? And I'm gonna forget a lot of them. I mean, uh, uh, Donnie Hathaway lived up here. Um, I, you know, And I know for a fact that at that time there was a community up here, right? Okay, so cut to now and there's still like, right? I mean, FK Twigs is over here and you know, Quentin Tarantino's over there. And I'm here ready to hang, right? But there is no, there's no community. There's no community like there was. And, and so in fact, we're thinking, you know, like a lot of other people, like, I don't know if I wanna, as magical as it is up here, I don't know if I, I want to continue living without a community, right? Um, and my wife even more so. So I'm blessed, which is kind of, it's unfair, but I have a community through the gallery. Mm-hmm. So we've been really doing an effort more and more and more of, I mean, we have a big publishing uh, initiative that we do. We're doing a lot of performance we're doing lectures. We're doing um, all kinds, doubling down on on that pointedly for community. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, LA is sprawl um, as well. So you have pockets and you have to kind of, you know, create these something to get people together to experience something and then share and, and talk about it or share it. How do you make people feel welcome? Um, we're free. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think lately, again, in this initiative, it's been very uh, organic and very blunt and very truthful as well. Mm-hmm. It's not, um, there's no strategy. Like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have an organic garden and like, we're going to have this kind of regular speaker, like like this kind of speaker and this kind of performance. And we're going to look at it from a strategic, like almost um, how are we going to look to the world? Mm-hmm. How are we presenting ourselves mm-hmm. to the world? Mm-hmm. Um, almost algorithmically in a way. <laughs> we're doing it just what we're into. Mm-hmm. It's, very, it's very much how we've always run the galleries. It's very like, yes great this is great and it's very diverse so it's not um cocooned um which i also respect that kind of aesthetic and take by the way there's some some of my favorite galleries run their gallery in a very specific line more more conceptually driven or a very particular you know and that's great i'm into that but for us there's just just a kind of voracious interest in so many different things so it's just organic it's just organic like what's good what's good is good yeah and you're going to get different people coming for different things based on their interests because maybe their interests aren't as diverse yeah uh and it it's super cool we recently hosted for the second or third year in a row the acid free book fair for three days which was amazing hundreds of exhibitors the parking lot filled uh with performance and you know food and i mean it was like you just felt like, wow, that's so, I mean, we gave up our gallery for, th- for three days 
on a big weekend. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I like that idea of um, taking a stand. And I feel like that's something that, that you guys have always done in a, in a way that is um, like not aggressive. It's just clear, you know, like, hey, we think this is cool. And if you do, come and check it out. So true. Right? It's totally true. I had a conversation, just, yeah, I had a conversation about that yesterday <laughs> regarding a show we have, uh, we have up now. Yeah. Uh, uh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Totally. I mean, and that's yeah, where we that's can't where do it any other way. I think in. it's right. like we, I mean, we could, but you'd have to like be consciously um, almost grotesque Something and strategic. Else. Yeah. You wouldn't be. Yes. Yeah. Well, I've always, um, I mean, I'm known for always saying what I think, right? And I've always said, sometimes I ask first, if someone asks my opinion, I always say like, are you sure you want to know? Because I'm going to tell you, like I can either say nothing, which sure. is fine with me, or I can tell you what I really think. Sure. So, but I always have to say what I really think because mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, you might forget, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, or get yourself twisted around or mm -hmm. whatever. But if you just show up as who you are and share what you're interested in, then people either like it or they don't. And, and that's cool. <laughs> well, I'm very similar, as you know. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it any other way. So it's either take it or leave it. It's it's great. It's fine. Right. It just is. It is. It is yeah. just, it just is. Yeah. So when you talked about the idea of, um, artists kind of looking into the void or maybe even like jumping into the void and, and the kind of like excitement or energy around that. Do you think that's a safe or unsafe or maybe it's not even binary in that way? Um, but what do you think, what do you think the, um, what do you think happens with that? You know, and, and, I guess what happens to those of us who are not doing that, but get to be around it? Okay. So the first thing that comes to my mind, it might not even be the right threat, but um, problems I've seen in the art world have come, which they do in the world, most often with great success and money. Um, a Unfortunately, these are powerful um, mechanisms for influencing a person's um, decision-making and personality. The, the biggest um, flaws or issues that come up with this are when an artist, and this could be a musician or an architect or anything, when they're trying to simply maintain themselves in the world. They're trying to maintain an image they've created of themselves in the world as opposed to trashing that image at, at every given turn. So that's the difference between, and I, you know, we could pull some examples um, it, that are quite self-evident where an artist is just on repeat mm -hmm. um, because they've created, they, they can't stop feeding the image they've built of themselves um, as opposed to say somebody like, of course, the first one that would come to my mind would be Bruce Nauman, mm -hmm. um, who would be, you know, I think one of my all time favorites, you know, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, like mine too. It's just like, that's, that's what you want to do people. Mm -hmm. uh, it may not be fun nor easy um, at, at all. Uh, for me, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite distinct. And it's quite fast to, to see like who's, who's um, tripping themselves up mm -hmm. and who's just l leaping perhaps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, another that, one that comes to mind. And again, this is funny because I know that most dealers only talk about their own artists, but I certainly never do. But the other one who I've always found to be really super amazing, um, one of my favorite artists working is Seth Price, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, in fact, another artist that I actually live with, um, in fact. Um, 
you know, you can just, you can just tell. I mean, you just, just if you follow the work or follow the practice of the, the, the writings or the performances or the film, you know, it's, it's like, objectively, this is super exciting for me to, to be in the art world and see this kind of uh, action. Mm-hmm. I get, re- it's very, and, and you see it, you know, and that's a dramatic example because like Nauman or Seth Price is, is quite distinct, right? Because they're so... Uh, multidisciplinary and, and diverse in their practices. That's not to say that this doesn't happen with a pure painter um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or or somebody who works exclusively in another kind of medium, right? It's interesting. I mean, the other one that would would quickly come to mind would be again because we mentioned it, Grotjan going from pure ab- pure pure abstraction in these in the butterfly works. It's actually an artist you work with. I just realized. Um, to the face paintings um, and and also like which is also exciting to me I mean Robert Ryman is exciting to me much like Grotjohn's butterflies like setting up a system and then experimenting to the uh, furthest point on the plane um, forever until you're done right uh, and then cycle into a new in, in his case faces or like with Ryman it's like white like it's so exciting and that's a restrictive, a consciously restrictive terrain that he created for himself. But look at what he could do. Um, that's quite distinctly different from others who, I, I won't even name any, but you know, that, that um, yeah. So this morning I was actually listening to the um, outtakes of the podcast that I did with Seth Price. So um, I mean, an hour ago. So I didn't even know that you you had done it. Yeah, that's funny. And okay. I have a, I have a show um, with him at the Aspen Art Museum currently. It's one of my last ones. I, but I, I, that completely yeah. spa- uh, no, but uh, spaced. No, but that's hysterical. but that's what's so yeah. interesting, right? And again, that gets back to that idea of you know everything is as it should be. And uh, Bruce Nauman's work, "Pay Attention, Motherfuckers," is. I mean, that's kind of my signpost for art and life yeah. and that notion of, you know, being awake yeah. and paying attention. Well, so. for sure. I mean, that the wakefulness is relates to all the things we were just talking about. Yeah. And consciousness and awareness. And, and your um, distinction between sort of like tripping inadvertently and leaping. Right. And yeah. so that idea of, you know, consciousness, attention, um, intention. That's what I've always been drawn to mm-hmm. is an artist's intention. For sure. Well, we all should live with a clear intention. Ideally. Yeah. The should, but yes. Yeah. So uh, are there things that I, I'm thinking about? this idea of, of going and spending the time with Ram Dass to talk about death. Um, and that's something a lot of people are afraid of. Um, so are there things you fear? <laughs> well, of course. Yeah, of course there are. Yeah. Are you kidding? I mean, death would be, would be, uh, one of them. I've, I've been working on that, which is, why, one of the reasons why I was there. Um, it's funny because I've always talked about death, oddly enough. Death is, uh, I mean, everybody has their own experience with death, uh, of course, because it's the one, con- one, of the, one of the two great commonalities we all have, birth and death. Um, my first, my wife and my first daughter passed away um, after she was born, beautifully in 1995 it was our first child and it was very soon after we'd gotten married uh and had just opened a gallery mm-hmm. so that m- mediated my life for mm-hmm. a long time thereafter where i mean it was a c- miracle to come through that and then to end up with these three great you know kids that um were born and lived so certainly that's a major thematic thing for me. Hmm. It's, it's, it's really stems from that. So you asked the right question. I mean, I mean, so 
I didn't deal with it for a long time, which caused lots of problems for me and everybody else around me. Um, but I have been confronting this quite aggressively for the last five years, really, uh, deeply, deep diving. Um, and that was kind of the end. That was like the kind of ultimate experience um, to have gone to Maui and to have spent this time with, uh, with Ram Das, who was dying, uh, as we all are, but he was closer to death than hopefully we are, and um, who just passed away. Um, there was also this, 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 I used to be obsessed with the Indian, Indian tribes when I was younger, but then I rewrote or reread a book on, about Crazy Horse, the great chief of the Lakota tribe. And um, he used to, I used to always say this, I think flippantly in a way, but it was like, I was trying to be like that. He would come out of his teepee every morning and he would just declare it's a beautiful day to die. And it's like, it's like, you know, these are commonalities throughout different um, philosophical ways of living, of course, around the world throughout history of dealing. And, and our culture doesn't, they want to put sickness and death somewhere else, anywhere but here. And, you know, look, we, we, right, our old dog is dying, which is why we're hunkered back here in the back of the house, because he's, you know, in the main room, the family hearth, you know, actively dying. Um, I know plenty of people who would, at this point, have put him down, mm -hmm. put, put, you know, they want to put granny down, frankly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's a major, one of the most significant problems in our world, hmm. especially in America, um, in dealing and talking about and confronting death super liberating to deal with it and talk about it. It's kind of amazing. Thank you for being so open about it. Um, when you talked about Ram Dass being closer to death than hopefully we are, you knocked on the table, um, and, and I did too, <laughs> which is, you know, um, touching wood or touching paper or um, are you superstitious? I'm really not. There's a few things I do since I, if I see a, a penny on the ground, I always pick it up. I, I have to pick it up and put it in my pocket and I knock on wood, but I'm not superstitious per se. Yeah. I do both of those things too. Why do you, why do you stop and pick up the penny? I have no idea. It's one of those things I got into when I was young as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like it was like, once I got into this thing, I couldn't stop. It's yeah. like, uh, good luck. Yes, I think about Obviously. it as luck. Yeah, I also think about it somehow. I think I'm maybe more superstitious than you are, but um, I I, th I feel like if you walk by money, then it's somehow telling the universe that you don't need any more. That's cool. That could be. <laughs> that could be. Yeah, for sure. So, but, you know, it's yeah. about the, the law of attraction. Yeah, right, exactly. I asked you why you loved art. Um and maybe your answer to this would be comparable, but, you know, why do you think art matters? Right. Well, it's definitely related inextricably. I mean, you know, when I, when I, when, when, when I think of art, I don't think of, of just um, what we work with, what yeah, the galleries, you know, trade in. or I think of really... I think of performance, I think of music, I think, cause it's, it, these are all things that are super important for, for me. Um, I mean, and film, you know, et cetera. It's like, it's, it's, it's everything. I mean, it's just everything. That's not to take away from having a fantastic sale uh, in the sea or like a, a incredible hike through beautiful nature and having th these are, I mean, these are artistic, these are experiences much, much, I can feel the same doing that as I am experiencing a great concert or a great work of art. Right. But it's such a great complicated question. In fact, it's interesting. Something else this brings reminds me of is I remember I was obsessed with Henry Miller 
when I was younger too. Read all of his books. And I remember he, in a book, I don't remember which one, spoke really precisely about how of all the arts, music was the one that for him was the most, had the most power or ability to um, tap into one's soul or emotion. And because I'm so involved with music, um, that really always resonated with me. And I don't see as much music as I used to, but I do see quite a bit. And there's certain key experiences where you're like just moved, right? Like just transported, yep. like whether it's through kind of tears of just inexplicable emotion to joy or what have you. Yeah, it, it's so rare to experience this with, with um, the art in which we deal. Um, not to, they're different experiences. Um, and they're all, in, in my book, they're all, e they're all equal. Same with, you know, cinema, that's, um, for sure. And, and this is something that was always interesting and important for the gallery was that the idea of like all these arts are cross-pollinating are always so vital. And all the great artists that we work with, of course, are also looking, listening, and watching the same things that we're interested in. And there is no distinction or division. Um, uh, and I think that's where I get, I can, I can have trouble with what I, uh, you know, a lot of people don't allow themselves to be exposed to so much more that there is. And we were talking about space and architecture and furniture and, you know, um, music and, and art and scent and, you know, food. And it's an amazing world, right? I mean, it's so spectacular. <laughs> Still, even in this dark, cynical time. Yeah. And I, I think that's the perfect way to end. You know, art is everything and life can, in fact still be spectacular for sure thank god right now more than ever yeah. right now more than ever thank you so much yeah thank you conversations about art is part of heisey.art this episode was produced by simon illa our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We'll be back again every other Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>